स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Today we will continue talking about uh, the Zillow theorems. So we still haven't actually stated any of the Zillow theorems, but recall from last time that we stated the following proposition B, which uh, was motivated by our understanding of how P groups acts act on sets whose cardinalities are co-prime to P. Okay, so this was a converse to that P group acting with fixed points proposition. So we had called it proposition B last time. So let me just recall the statement in the contrapositive form, which says, suppose I have a group G whose cardinality is divisible by P, but suppose G is not a P group. Okay, then you can construct a finite G set X such that P doesn't divide the cardinality of X and such that there are no fixed points. Okay, so this is the, in some sense, a statement about the existence of fixed point free actions with also satisfying that cardinality co-prime to P condition. Okay, and these are the blanket assumptions. G and X are always finite. P is some fixed prime number. Okay, now uh, this is going to somehow be our, our starting point for the first Silo theorem. So let me state uh, what is called Silo theorem number one. Silo theorem one. Okay, uh, what does it say? It says, let uh, G be a finite group whose cardinality is divisible by P. So same assumption as above. So I will uh, assume that the cardinality of G is of the form P power dm. So I am assuming the cardinality is divisible by P. So I will say D, the power D is at least 1 and here M is at least 1. Okay. So let G be a finite group whose cardinality is divisible by P. That is all this statement is saying. Then the Silo theorem says that there exists a subgroup H such that cardinality of H is exactly P power D. So take the maximum power of P which divides the cardinality of the group, you can find a subgroup of that exact cardinality. Okay, so this is this uh, celebrated theorem statement is called Silo theorem number one and it will turn out that in some sense this statement here is actually equivalent to proposition B. Okay, So this is this is the in fact what we will talk about today. Okay, So I will at least establish one side of the, the equivalence and leave the other team. So let us prove the Silo theorem. So we have already proved proposition B. Let us use proposition B to show how the first Silo theorem uh, follows. Okay, so let me prove proof of this Silo theorem. So first observe that if G is already a P group, if G is a P group, what does that mean? It means that G, the cardinality is already a power of P. In other words, the number M is just 1. Then this is trivial. The assertion is trivial. I just take H to be G itself. Okay. And so the theorem is done. I mean, the proof is done. There's nothing to do. Okay. So done. Otherwise, in other words, if M is at least 2 or in other words, there are other primes which divide the cardinality of the group, then let's use proposition B. Okay. Now we are in the setting of proposition B which says that if a prime divides the cardinality of the group, but G is not a power of that prime, the cardinality of G is not a power of that prime, then I can manufacture a fixed point free action uh, whose cardinality or uh, fixed point free action on a G set whose cardinality is not divisible by P. Okay. So otherwise, okay. so now let us use proposition B uh, to conclude the following, use proposition B or let us write it as using proposition B by proposition B there exists a 
or G set X with two properties such that P doesn't divide the cardinality and there are no fixed points. Okay. Now, uh, what does this get us? Here's the first observation. So, suppose I have a set X on which the group acts. Recall that there are the, the action of the group splits this into equivalence classes which are the different orbits. So, let me just draw a picture. These are let us say the different orbits of the various elements. Okay. So, I have my orbits okay. G orbits in X. Okay. That is what the picture is. Now, observe that the sum of all these orbits. So, let us give these orbits names maybe O1, O2 dot dot dot. There are some finitely many of them. Observe that the sum of the orbit cardinalities is of course, the cardinality of the whole set X. Okay. So, this cardinality plus this plus this plus this plus this and so on is just going to give you the full cardinality. Now, since the whole cardinality is not divisible by P, at least one of these OIs there exists an orbit whose cardinality is not divisible by P. Right. Otherwise, every if every single orbit had cardinality divisible by p, the total sum would also be divisible by p. Okay. So, let us pick that orbit. So, let us take an element in that orbit. Maybe, so in my picture, let us just say, uh, maybe this, this green fellow has cardinality which is not divisible by p. So, I will take this orbit and let me pick a particular element in this orbit. Okay. So, let me take an element inside. So, let me call that element something A. Okay. So, let, um, let A belong to that orbit. So, suppose, so let us say, so suppose A is that guy, suppose the orbit of A, uh, so this is, remember this is the notation G dot A just means the orbit of A has uh, the property that P does not divide the orbit cardinality. Okay. Uh, suppose the orbit of A has the property, you should say, has the property okay. So, consider that particular orbit, the one that is marked in green there. Now, uh, let us recall the, the counting statement which says that recall the counting theorem which says that the cardinality of an orbit is just the cardinality of the full group divided by the cardinality of the stabilizer. Okay, so, what is G A here? G A is nothing but the stabilizer of A which just means it is all group elements G which fix A. Okay, so, this is just the counting theorem. So, what does this, this mean? So, what is this, this uh, G A here? So, what are our conclusions? So, here are various conclusions. Consider this new subgroup. So, remember the Silo theorem says that we are trying to find a subgroup with some properties. Okay. So, consider this subgroup G A. Okay, so, this is sort of going to be my candidate for my silo subgroup or my subgroup H whose thing is a power of P. So, let me call it H1. Consider the subgroup H1 which is the stabilizer of G. So, this is a subgroup. Okay, so, this is just my notation for now. I am just calling G A as H1. What do we know about it? Okay, consider this. Now, let me try and figure out some facts about it. First thing I know is that the cardinality of G by the cardinality of this, this stabilizer. So, cardinality of G divided by cardinality of G A is the cardinality of the orbit which is not divisible by P. That was our assumption. 
Okay. So now what does that mean? So let's write this cardinality of G as P to the D times M. Cardinality of G A will be some power of prime P to the D prime times some number M prime. Okay. So D prime is some power. So I don't know, could be zero as well. M prime is some number, which is one or more. Okay. Now, uh, let us divide cardinality of G by cardinality of G A. So, observe any, any number, any natural number can always be written in this form as P to the some power times some natural number, okay, uh, uniquely where P does not divide M prime. Okay, so, this is P to the power D prime times M prime. Now, uh, in this quotient, what is it that I know that finally, there are no powers of P occurring. Okay, so, after I, I, I consider this quotient here, after I have cancelled out all the common factors, what I know is that no p's occur, no powers of p are left over. No powers of p uh, divide this quotient. Well, when can that happen? It can only happen if every power of p on the denominator, everything here cancelled out everything on top, right? Only then can you not have any p's remaining. So, remember m and m dash are relatively prime to p, right? They have no p's in them. They are products of powers of other primes. So, what does this mean? This means that the only way this could have happened is if this power d prime was actually equal to this power d, okay? In other words, what have we done? We have constructed a subgroup g a which has the following property that its uh, cardinality looks like this. It is p to the d times m dash, okay? uh, the d being the same d as what we had for the original group. Okay? Okay, so, this subgroup, so maybe let me call this subgroup not as h1, but as h dash. Okay? So, h dash is this, this subgroup here. And what I conclude is that H dash has, so it is it's just another name for G A. This is, uh, has cardinality which also looks like this, P to the D times M dash, okay, for the same power P to the D, M dash, P does not divide M dash, okay. Now, so we are almost there. In other words, H dash is almost the subgroup we are looking for. What is it that the Silo theorem says? Um, here is a statement, it says that I can find a subgroup H of G whose cardinality is just P to the D, okay, just that maximum power P to the D. This is an almost, so by the way, this such a subgroup H is called a silo subgroup or a P silo subgroup. What we have manufactured now is something which is almost a P silo subgroup. Its cardinality is, it the maximum power of P is the same, it's still P to the D. But then there is some additional factor m dash here, okay, which could be one or more. If m dash is one, then we are done. Okay. Okay. So we are almost there. So this is uh, let's see. So let me observe the following: that to start with, I had my original group G, whose cardinality was p to the d m dash. Uh, sorry, p to the d m. Now, inside G, I manufactured this G A subgroup, which we will call H dash, whose cardinality is also the form P to the D times something. Okay. Now, observe this G is of course, bigger than, than H dash. H dash is a subgroup of G. So, observe certainly that M uh, has to be greater than or equal to M dash. Okay, because the cardinality of H dash is, is um, less than or equal to the cardinality of G. Okay? But uh, in fact, this is strictly smaller. Okay? But observe something more, uh, M is actually strictly bigger than M dash. Okay? In other words, this is a, a proper subgroup. This is not the whole guy. It is actually a proper subgroup. In other words, H dash cannot be the whole thing. Okay, why not? Because if H dash, the subgroup we have constructed is the whole group G, 
then it means that well what was h dash it was the the stabilizer of that element g if the stabilizer of that element is the whole group then that just means that every element of the group stabilizes that element a in other words the orbit of a is just the singleton a itself right or if you want to think in terms of cardinalities the cardinality of the orbit is just one Okay, now what does that mean? It means A is a fixed point. Okay, but that's a contradiction. Remember, this was a fixed point free action. So that's why we're using that property. That since it was a fixed point free action, the subgroup, the stabilizer of that element A is a proper subgroup of the big group. Okay. So we have managed to, to sort of reduce the size of the problem. Instead of the original group G, we now have a proper subgroup h prime okay and both g and h prime have the same power of p the same highest power of p dividing both okay now it's all we have to do is really repeat the argument now here's the next step if h prime is a p group if h prime is a p group what does that mean it means that that power m prime is exactly one i'm, I'm sorry the number m prime is one let's go up again which means that uh, this is already just the cardinality is p to the d okay there's no m prime in it then we are done then h prime itself is your silo group right is the p silo subgroup because its cardinality is exactly p power d okay then again we are done then take h the p silo subgroup in the theorem to just p h prime and we can stop the proof right there okay if not if not well, then let us repeat the above set of arguments, Re repeat the above arguments using proposition B. So, remember proposition B is, is really the key statement that we need. It says if you have a non-P group, then you can construct a nice fixed point free action. Okay? So, if you see what we have done, if G is not a P group, it had cardinality P to the dm and if M is not 1, it's not a p group then we are able to construct a subgroup h prime whose cardinality now looks like p to the d m prime if m prime is 1 then you are done if m prime is greater than 1 which means that this is also not a p group then you can repeat the argument and construct another subgroup h prime and this subgroup h prime also has so the subgroup h prime has cardinality which is again of the same form which is the power of p is still the same and the uh, the number m is now the number m dash or rather m double dash in this case okay so let's call it m double dash now if m double dash is 1 which means if h uh, double prime is a p group then again we are done okay so now again uh, you know it's now a question of just repeating the argument again and again so observe if m double dash is 1 then we are done if m double dash equals 1 then the silo group you are looking for is just h double prime you are done else repeat the argument again okay okay so else would mean m double dash is also positive strictly bigger than 1 you can construct another guy and so on so observe that this sequence of uh, subgroups that we are constructing they all have the following property that they all have cardinalities of the form p power d into something that p power d is the same throughout and these numbers m m m dash m double dash m triple dash are all uh, you know m is strictly bigger than this is strictly bigger than this is strictly bigger than this and so on they're all at least one of course Okay. Why is this strict inequality is because at every step you have a proper subgroup, right? So the cardinality of G is strictly bigger than the cardinality of H prime, which means that since P power D factor is the same, M had better be bigger than M prime. Okay. So I, I construct such a strictly descending chain, but all of them are at least one, right? So this means that the process has to stop somewhere. You can't keep going on forever. The process has to stop. And at some point it stops, you, re you have to reach 1, which means that 
there is some subgroup at some dash 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 uh, has cardinality p power d into the corresponding m dash 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 had better be 1 okay so in other words it's cardinality is p power d okay so you you can't keep going on and on here at some point the process has to stop which means that you must have reached a p group okay and that's really the the proof of the theorem okay so this is um, proof complete Okay. So, if you have seen maybe the proof of, of Silo's theorem from you know prior courses and so on, this is uh, it looks slightly different, uh, but it has, the proof has been arranged in this manner primarily to, to focus on the fact that Silo's theorem itself is actually uh, you know just a consequence of a statement about the existence of fixed point free action. So, this is really what underlies Silo's theorem, that is what is going on in the background. Okay, now uh, so I hope you will sort of look through this proof again and try to understand the the basic idea here. It's a, it's a rather simple idea that at every step, if you have a p group, you're done. If it's not a p group, you can construct a fixed point free action. Take one of the orbits in that in that action, which is not divisible by p, the cardinality not divisible by p, and the stabilizer of an element there will give you a proper subgroup and you know keep going on and on and on at some point that stabilizer will have to become a p group okay otherwise this process goes on forever which is a contradiction okay now that's uh, that's an interesting uh, consequence of proposition b but what is extremely interesting is that in fact uh, the first silo theorem also implies proposition b okay so we have proved one implication but in fact one can show that you can now assume the statement of Silo theorem 1 and deduce proposition B from it. Okay? So, I am going to leave this as an exercise for you, but uh, please do try this exercise. Uh, show that Silo theorem 1. implies the statement of proposition B. Okay, so, assume this statement and prove the other statement. Okay. So, uh, which means that, so what is proposition B state? If it is not a P group, then you should somehow construct a set X on which the group acts without fixed points. Okay. And to do that, you have to use the Silo subgroup now. Okay. So, if G is uh, uh, given to be a non-P group, uh, look at the p silo subgroup of that group and use the group and the subgroup to somehow construct the set x on which the group acts without fixed points okay so it's a it's a very interesting and um, uh, useful exercise and i hope you will you will uh, try your hand at it